Okay, this uh, is the Talbot Park, uh, made for the, uh, the family that donated the land to us uh, to allow us to build this turning loop. Uh, before we had this park, the uh, rails stopped just over the hill a little bit, I mean, they just stopped. So cars like this weren't a problem because it can be operated, <coughs> excuse me, from either direction. But some of the cars, of course, you have been in our collection, are really only intended to operate in one direction. So to use them, we would have to back them all the way back or all the way up, which is really a nuisance. So uh, passengers liked it because they could, you know, flip the seats over and all that. But it was a little tough on the cruiser. So this has helped us quite a bit. Uh, the other reason we call it park is to try to uh, suggest a little bit the idea of the old trolley parks that the trolley companies were once building. Uh, Back in the days when trolleys were at the most popular, because people worked six days a week. Uh, so for six days a week, the trolleys were carrying passengers, they were making money, and everything was great. But on the, uh, the seventh day, Sunday, people didn't work. The trolley company still had to operate, at least on a reduced schedule, so they were running cars with no people, they weren't making money. So they uh, discovered over time that if they had a line that ran out into the countryside, basically nowhere like this, uh, they could build something at the end of that line that people wanted to ride to. So now the trolley company is making money, carrying the people out and back, and then whatever was there might have an admission charge or whatever. Uh, they started off, it could have been just like a, uh, a baseball field or a, a, a restaurant or petting zoo, things like that, and then over time they kept adding to them and adding to them until they had regular full fledged some of them full fledged amusement parks. Uh, even those uh, were sometimes powered by the, the power from the overhead wire. They had the wire already out there, had electricity, they could tap into it and operate things like married rounds of Ferris wheels uh, using the same type of motor and controller that we have in the cars. Uh, some of the uh, because most of those trolley parks are gone now, but a few of them uh, have stayed on as full-fledged amusement parks, and mostly it's not really obvious now that they were once built by the trolley companies. Uh, the nearest example here would be Canterbury Lake in Salem, New Hampshire, which was originally built as a trolley park. Uh, there were several here in Maine, uh, they're all gone. This, uh, Museum uh, mentioned, as we mentioned, uh, was established in 1939. Uh, at that time, the Biffitt Saco Street Railway, which operated Biffitt Saco Old Orchard area, was uh, getting ready to discontinue their trolleys and go to operating uh, buses. Uh, there was a group of uh, rail fans in Boston, I believe they were students, who uh, heard about this and decided that they'd like to come up and take a last ride on the trolleys before they were discontinued. So they did that uh, and discovered in the course of that that the car they were riding on, an open car, was uh, going to be junked along with all the others. So they decided that was really too bad, that it would be nice to save one of these, these old cars. So they uh, pooled their resources and excuse me, talked to the trolley company uh, people and ended up buying the car for $150. Because in 1939, for a bunch of students, that was a lot of money. But they, they decided it was worth it. Because once you have a trolley car, what do you do with it? You know, part of the agreement was that they had to remove it and so on. So they uh, searched around and they found a farmer who was willing to rent them a little piece of land, which is where our entrance is now. So they brought the trolley car there by truck, and it sat there on blocks, looking very tired, until of course World War II came along, so they couldn't do anything then. Uh, so it just sat there, looking pretty abandoned. We have photos of it that look pretty sad. Uh, after the war, uh, they started getting more active. Uh, a group approached them from uh, the Manchester and the Hampshire area, they had also preserved a car, which is an early wooden implement, and you know, the neighbors were starting to complain. They had to find a place to put it, so they brought it here, and from that, our collection just kind of took off uh, to the point that now we have about 1,200 members. Uh, we have, uh, I think there's over 200 vehicles in the collection, 
of those, about 45 or so, are restored and operable. Uh, in the early days of the museum, a lot of the cars that came here came directly from the operating systems where they had been, so they were operable and, you know, with, with a minor amount of work, we're able to, to uh, operate. Uh, any cars that we've gotten more recently, and there haven't been any for a year or two, uh, have been outside for you know, 50, 60 years. They've been summer camps and chicken coops and diners and all kinds of things. So when they come here, they're in terrible condition. So uh, our, our restoration time is getting longer and longer as we attempt to restore some of these cars. It's been a an ongoing process. Uh, we do it because we enjoy it. Uh, most of us are volunteers. Uh, we kid about getting paid double time and things like that. It hasn't happened to me yet. Maybe I'm missing an answer. But uh, anyway, we do it because we, we enjoy it. Uh, we believe that uh, trolleys are still a, uh, a viable method of transportation, and it's been interesting to see some of the cities that tore out their old-fashioned trolley cars in the 1950s. Now they're spending billions to put in light rail systems. You know, we were right all along. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, we have a bit of a pause here. There's another car following us out. and Obviously, with a single track, we can't go back until they get here. So, it's uh, all along. If, um, again, if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free. Yes, yes. The man in the back. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about that on the way back, aren't we? All right. <laughs> well, you gave away the whole thing. So. All right, I'll, I'll do that, and we will have to. Uh, on the way back, we'll still make a stop there. Uh, okay. The next two weekends, we have really what is our big event of the year. Uh, it's the Pumpkin Patch Trolley. Uh, there's a field, and we built a little platform there to make it easier for people to get on and off. Uh, right now, the field looks empty, but within the next few days, magically, a whole mess of pumpkins will appear there. It's, uh, I'm not quite sure how that happens, and I'm not going to look too deeply. Uh, anyway, the, the way uh, the event operates is people ride out on the trolley. It's a great event for the small children. Uh, get off the trolley, go out into the field, pick pumpkins. Uh, there's also activities there like face painting and luminaries and things like that for the kids. Uh, the trolley continues on and does its thing. Uh, when people have their pumpkins, they turn them in uh, at their tables there and get a, a baggage check, a baggage ticket, which they keep with them while they spend the rest of the day, whatever, touring the museum. In the meantime, a freight trolley comes out and brings all the pumpkins back to the visitor center. When people are ready to leave for the day, they uh, redeem their baggage tickets, get their pumpkins, which are either painted up or not, and uh, Proceed. It's, it's a very popular event, and we have a lot of fun with it, and we move a lot of pumpkins. So, anyway, that, that's my commercial message for the day. Morrison Hill. Morrison Hill.